15 years have passed since the war between humans and demons began. The humans entered the demon realm through the gate, taking one of the demons' strategic positions. While human forces were deployed there, demon forces occupied one of the human territories. The small frozen nations of the south fought with the demons. The battle brought suffering to the people. Amidst the confusion, a hero arose with three companions. He went to defeat the demons. Due to the hero's rate of success, the people put a lot of hope in him. The hero advanced alone, due to his reasons for the demon realm. The hero walks into the large castle. He finds it strange when he doesn't notice anyone in the hallway. He rushes into the main hall to fight the demon lord. The hero carries his sword to fight the figure on the throne, but stops when he sees a horned lady with red hair there. He nervously asks her who she is, and she tells him she's the demon king. He looks at her from head to toe, and repeats his question. The horned girl says the same thing, and it makes the hero ask why she is a woman. She tells him that it's a traditional title, and calls herself the 43rd Demon King. The demon girl says her title is Ruby Eyes. She tries showing him the Demon King's crest on her chest, but the hero flusters and runs backwards. He stretches his sword forward and says, he is here to defeat her, but the Demon King walks close to him and greets him properly. It makes the hero ask her why she's so casual with him, but she tells him of how long she's been waiting to speak to him. The hero blushes and tries to maintain his confidence, but the Demon King spreads her arms and asks him to be hers. He refuses, and she wonders why. The hero explains the countless wars happening outside her territory because of her armies. The hero's party is left alone by the hero. They curse and re-strategize their next actions to take. The hero talks about a forest country. He blames her armies for darkening the clouds and making the people of the country suffer. The Demon King explains pollution to him through chopping of trees, but he doesn't understand. He brings up another case of the Tin Country, but she gets fed up with him and says that humans are simply blaming the demons for the evils they've been caught doing. The hero brings up the Southern Territory. He says he has seen the war between humans and demons and she cannot buy her way out of it this time around. The Demon King walks to her throne and brings out a scroll. She says humans have also killed her people. The hero readies his sword to attack her, but she touches it and tells him to stop. She says she loves him and he refuses her. The Demon King hands him the scroll she picked earlier. He asks her what it's about, and she cannot complete her sentence because he doesn't understand economics. She calls it the summary of all the war advantages from one's point of view. The hero says, there isn't benefit to war. In the human realm, three leaders sit at a table and make a great toast to the war. At the demon realm, the hero goes through the scroll and asks if the humans can ever be okay with what is written inside. The demon king replies to him and says, demons aren't different. She says in the past, Minor nobles and lords name themselves kings, one after another, fighting bloody wars. She tells him that she has united all the nobles in her name. The hero sees her point, but calls her a war criminal. He says he understands he'll accompany her, but she collects the scroll and tells him that they cannot end the war with the way things are. The hero asks why. The prince of the southern territory is addressed by his father. He asks his father why they have to continue the war, but his father tells him that they have to do it due to the funds they receive from the central territories. He says their nation was on the verge of annihilation. The demon king walks with the hero through her castle and explains to him what the southern territory is facing. The hero sees it as a good thing, but she tells him it's not. The two of them dine at a table and argue. She tells the hero about how the other territories are offered protection by the southern territory due to the funding they are supplying them. She picks up a lamp and hands it over to the skeptical hero. The demon king blows out the light in the room and the lamp illuminates the room. She informs him of how the lamp shows the memories of people who hold it. They appear in a memory of the hero. He sees the little version of himself inside a ballroom. He tells her how the people partied then like there was no war, but she corrects him. The demon lord tells him the reason they can do it is because of war. It makes no sense for the hero, so he asks for clarification. She tells him that if peace reigned, there wouldn't be jobs for a lot of people, and food wouldn't reach the people of the southern territory. She asks him to sit down. The demon king shows him a memory of how people were burned to death. She says it would happen a lot because they fell short in agricultural production. She says sickness would arise, and a lot of people would be killed, and millions would die. A blonde knight, accompanied by an older male warrior, speaks as they walk through the forest. She asks if it's okay to tell the people that the hero left them, but he tells her the people will assume that the hero got scared and fled. The girl wonders why the hero left them. The hero holds his head and finds it difficult to accept the truth about the war. She tells him about how the humans would find out that with war, or without war, they'll perish. She tells him that if the humans lose, demons will take over, create colonies for themselves, and fight each other. She says the same thing will happen for mankind. 
The hero defends humans, but the demon king takes the lamp from him and shows him a memory. They are on a boat moving through a lake. She says the lake represents the world that they cannot see beyond, and she wishes for the hero to be hers. The demon king asks the hero to be her eyes and her blade. The hero refuses, but she pesters him. The demon king asks that she give him half of the world, but he doesn't buy the idea. She says that she knew he'd decline the offer, so she agrees to give herself to him, while he becomes hers. The hero gets up looking all flustered, and the demon king approaches him. She corners him, and asks him to be hers. She says, it'll be for the betterment of their people, if they can find a way for both sides to win. She convinces him, that she doesn't just want him for the people, but also herself. The demon king doesn't believe that she has the looks men want in females, but the hero convinces her that she does. They agree with each other that they'll be killing people, and doing horrible things. She asks for permission to touch his face, and he agrees. They vow to belong to each other, and the demon king tries hugging the hero. He pushes her away and grabs his sword. The hero asks her for their first move, and the demon king says they'll start with food distribution. She looks sad thinking she forced the hero into agreeing with her, but he reassures her and stretches forth her hand. The demon king asks if she can hug the hero before punching him. He pushes her off and she touches the memory lamp, a memory of her kissing a sackcloth dressed as the prince appears. The prince looks at her and she shyly tells him that she has to be prepared for things like that. She leaves the lamp and the memory stops. The demon king removes her horns and it surprises the hero. She tells him that she doesn't use them most of the time. She takes the demon king by the hand and they leave the room. Two young girls escape from their master and run into hiding. The demon king and the hero teleport into a town. She tells him that it's better to experiment with their plan in such a small town rather than a flourishing country. A headmaid calls out to the demon king, and they meet her at her mansion. The hero and the demon king scold the housemaid for not being covert about their arrival. The maid speaks of how happy she is due to the hero and her master being wedded. The two of them try to clarify their situation to the maid, but it sounds like they are newly wedded. In the mansion, the demon king explains to the hero that each demon has its specialization. She says the head maid's specialization is the way of the maid, and she has been by her side since she was a little girl. The head maid enters the room and tells the demon king how she has informed the village elder of her arrival. The demon king has been disguised as a daughter of a noble family and a scholar of divinity in the holy capital. She is to act as a scholar who is in the village to teach the locals about new agricultural methods. The hero and the demon king decide they will tell their respective people about how they are injured from their battle with each other, and she is recovering in her castle. As for the hero, his fate is unknown, and some may say he ran away. The demon king plans to use this excuse to buy them time to find a way out of the war. The next day, the demon king, headmaid, and the hero, head out to the farmland. The Demon King tells the hero of the villagers' crop rotation cycle. They use a three-stage cycle, but the Demon King tells the hero that she wants the villagers to adopt a four-stage cycle. The hero thinks it'll worsen the soil quality, but the Demon King explains to him how it'll work. The hero realizes why the village was chosen. They meet up with the village elder and propose their plan, but the village elder was so adamant that it took them a lot of time to convince him. After leaving his house, the Demon King concludes that they'll have to focus on education first and foremost before any of their plans can come to fruition. Later that evening, in the mansion, the hero crouches by the living room fire, while the Demon Lord sits on the couch. She calls the hero to sit with her, and he does. The Demon King wonders why he doesn't fear her, but he says she is weak, and she doesn't have the strength to frighten him. She shyly tries to convince him to rest his head on her lap, and he obeys. She is surprised by his action, and runs her hand through his hair. The Demon King and the hero compliment each other. She asks if she can do what she wants, and he agrees. She lowers her head to kiss him, but they get interrupted by horse sounds. The hero gets up and hurries to the stable, and it makes the Demon King pout. She follows him to the stable and sees two girls hugging each other in the hay, while he calms the horses. The headmaid joins them in the stable and comments on the children being slaves who escape. The hero is surprised and tries to condemn slavery, but the headmaid walks past him and examines the kids. She notes them to be serfs. The Demon King explains to the hero that serfs are allowed to own possessions, unlike slaves. The Demon King asks the headmaid what she's been doing with the serfs that she has seen around her mansion. She replies to her that she's been reporting and taking them back. The hero tries to stand up for the slave, but the headmaid analyzes and explains the situation logically to him. She reaches for one of the girls, but the Demon King stops her. She tells her to take them in, draw a bath, and give them something decent to wear. 
she says the head maid can interrogate them the next morning. Inside a room, the hero and the demon king watch the children eat. The elder child thanks the adults for their hospitality, but pleads with the adults not to report them to the authorities the following morning. The head maid enters the room and hears the conversation. She speaks to the girls logically about their next steps to take. They plead, but she coldly rejects their offer. The hero tries to intervene, but the demon king stops him. He watches as the maid corrects the girl's behaviors, and they apologize. The older girl asks the head maid to make them human. They grovel at her feet, but the head maid corrects their posture, and asks them to curtsy instead. She asks the demon king for permission to employ the girls, and she grants her. The girls thank the head maid as she leaves the room. Days later, the smaller maid carries food into the forest for the hero. She sees him and they both share the food. The hero asks her how far she is in her classes, and the little girl replies that the demon king is teaching them letters and arithmetic. She tells the hero about how they are being taught a lot of things that they can implement later on in the future to bring about lots of food and reduce fighting. She stops talking when she sees the mood of the hero and asks him if anything is wrong. The hero replies that he feels like he is doing so little in helping them, but the girl mentions that he brings food for them. He mentions his bad points and wonders what he'll do when peace reigns. The demon king lectures some nobles and a knight in the mansion. She discusses with them about their strategy to stop the war. Some do not believe in the motive of war, while others who believe are seen as one-sided. After the lecture, the demon king sits on the staircase in the mansion, and the hero sees her. He meets up with her, and asks her what's wrong, causing her to explain how tiring it is teaching humans. She suggests turning them into frogs, but the hero rejects the idea. He asks if she'll be going to the village elder to teach, and says he'll be coming with her. They step out of the mansion, but it rains. Inside the rain, the demon king keeps talking about how cold she is. The hero embraces her under his cloak, and it makes her smile. They walk in the rain, leaving the mansion. The hero and demon king tell each other how glad they are to belong to one another. She opens a treasure box and shows him a secret weapon which she believes will help them get better results in educating the people of the village. After three months and nine days, the hero and the demon king return to the village to check the crops. They see the crops are flourishing. The villagers offer a gift to the demon king and thank her for teaching them a new method of cooking. They plan to invite the elder to a party. The hero and the demon king go to the mansion. On their way, they notice the students of the Demon King walking together. They enter the mansion and discuss it with the head maid. The head maid smiles at them and asks for more news, but the hero and the party don't have anything to say. The maid sighs after being disappointed. The hero and the Demon King teleport to a town. The hero walks the Demon King to the church and they talk about the light spirit. He tells her about how the church is very important to the people since it teaches them how to read and write. The Demon King plans on taking advantage of their power as an organization they get to the church and the prioress sees them. They are taken to the meeting room and asked to wait for the prioress. The hero informs the demon king that they'll have to run if negotiations fail, but the demon king tells him that no one can do it to them. The hero notices her sad countenance and tells her about it. He approaches her and says he sees her sad face from time to time, but the demon king doesn't know she's been putting up such a face. The prioress enters the room and the Demon King introduces herself as the Crimson Scholar from the Southern Territory, while the hero calls himself her escort. The Prioress looks at the hero and calls him the White Swordsman. She shouts his name, and he realizes that she's the female knight. She walks up to him and asks him about his whereabouts. She informs him about how long it has been since the party heard from him. He tries calming her down and says he feels bad about involving the party in his quest for the Demon King. The female knight slaps him and cries about how worried she is. He tries apologizing, but she tells him not to. She's mad at him for showing out of the blue with some beautiful woman. The hero tries explaining who the Crimson Scholar is, but the female knight suspects her to be his girlfriend. The Crimson Scholar sits them down and explains to the female knight about the story she came up with, a story that involves the hero retreating after injuring the demon king due to hordes of demons. She says that she took him in and treated his injuries after coming across him by chance, and he is repaying her kindness by being her bodyguard. The female knight apologizes for jumping to conclusions. The hero asks the female knight how she became a prioress, and she goes into details about the report she gave of him. Going alone to the demon king's castle, she received a letter that stated the hero's sacrifice against the demon king. 
the party was called in by the government and offered rewards to them. The female knight said that she refused her reward because it felt bad to profit from the hero's death so she came back to the church and tried helping in whatever way she could. The hero asks her about the other two party members, and she explains that the old man in their party went to work for some intelligence group in the southern territory. The hero asks about the mage and the female knight tells him that she is in the demon world looking for him. It surprises the hero since he knows the mage to be a money pincher. The crimson scholar shows the female knight a treasure box and opens it. Inside it are potatoes. The female knight wonders what's going on, but the scholar talks about food being prepared. Two nuns serve the prioress the food, and the scholar encourages her to try it. She tastes it and notices how good it is. The scholar explains how nutritious potatoes are. She notes that it grows in poor soil or colder climates, and it is below the soil which makes it safe from birds. She explains the benefits of the potato. She says the harvest in a year is three times more than wheat, and she plans to use it to save many starving people. The Crimson Scholar tells the prioress her motive for being there. She wants the prioress to establish a convent in Winter's Pass Village and teach the villagers new agricultural methods. The prioress says it's within their scope, but the scholar wants her to go broader than that, and it makes the prioress ask her for her motive. The Crimson Scholar tells her that it's to achieve a world without war. The prioress agrees and tells the scholar that the convent will assist. She plans on visiting the Winter Pass village personally, and it shocks the hero. He thinks of himself as someone dangerous for her, but the prioress says she's used to his behavior. She asks him coldly if there are other reasons why he doesn't want her present, and it makes him nervous. The scholar tells him it'll be rude of him if they do not allow the prioress to visit after accepting their terms and conditions. The prioress wonders why the scholar isn't worried about her presence, and the scholar tells her it's because she respects people whom she deals with, and the prioress says, likewise. The prioress thanks the light spirit for guidance, but the scholar tells her the efforts of the potatoes were done by people. The hero and the demon king leave the church and discuss as they walk. She calls the prioress the hero's old flame, and he denies it. They discuss the economic alliance of free merchants and southern independent cities. These merchants are groups of people whose reach extends across the entire continent. She suggests the merchants' total capital to be astronomical. The alliance is involved in 60% of the wheat trade in the south, and they have enough power to dethrone a king. The demon king refers to them as monsters. The hero asks her what the merchants are, and he says he's been used for their propaganda. The Demon King expects him to have been paid in millions of gold coins, but he was only offered 15. The Demon King tells him the truth about the merchants. Their motivation is self-preservation and expansion. She decides to fill him in on what she's been doing in her room for the past few months. The merchants meet with each other in a room and show each other a compass. The compass is magnificent and was made by the Crimson Scholar. They go through it and conclude to use it to take over the world. One of them tells the rest about how the village where the compass is from is negotiating Negotiating with the convent from faraway lands, the merchants see it as a problem, and they vow to have the compasses sold to only them. In the winter, Pass's village, two hunters offer the two housemaids of the head made gifts to give to the Crimson Scholar. They call the girls beautiful and talk about how everyone admires them. At night, the hero packs up his load and prepares himself to leave the village. The demon king visits his room and asks that he can't stop worrying about the female knight. She teases him about the female knight being his ex, and he refuses. She beckons the hero to follow her into a room. She shows him a demon armor and tells him not to worry about it being cursed. She hands him a list and asks him to meet up with some of her demon leaders that he can trust. She says he should be grateful, and he appreciates her. She wants him to show more of his appreciation by being intimate with her. The Demon King complains of being together with him for six months and they haven't held hands. She fears that he'll leave her for another woman once the convent is built in the village. The Demon King moves close to the hero while expecting a kiss, but he kisses her forehead and walks to the armor. She gets mad at him, but he tells her that he'll give her a proper one once he's back. He teleports with the armor, and she tells him that he better fulfill his wish. Months pass, and it is summer. The housemaids dress the Crimson Scholar and tell her that she's meeting with someone who can become an important trading partner. They watch the female knight as she trains the students of the village. The headmaid recalls the female knight's actions when she arrived and didn't meet the hero in the mansion. Outside the mansion, the female knight pulls a sword and asks one of the students to hold it with both of his hands. He obeys her, and she dissects the sword into bits with another sword. The headmaid speaks to the Crimson Scholar for not considering how she dresses ever since the hero left. They sew her a red dress that seems too revealing to her so she complains. 
The head maid tells her about the need to dress like that. Since she'll be meeting with the Merchant Alliance, the Crimson Scholar must handle the case by herself. She hopes the hero returns by the time of the meeting to make things smoother. The Demon King stubbornly says that they can do fine without the hero, and it makes the head maid caution her not to be too strong-headed. The little maid commends the Crimson Scholar, and it makes her blush. The merchants in their carriages spot the mansion of the Crimson Scholar and wonder about the kind of person waiting for them. One of them says that they should stick to their plan. The maid tells the Crimson Scholar to get dressed. She informs her that the horror ghosts and night ghosts are in place. The merchants arrive at the mansion, and they are surprised to find a beautiful woman as the scholar. The merchants praise her for her beauty and brains. She asks why they arrive later than she expected, but the scholar explains to her that it was due to the preparations they made for the trip. She asks that they start the negotiations. The scholar takes them to a table and shows them corn in a treasure box. She explains to them the conditions required for corn to grow and says it'll be useful in the central territory that is noted to be unfit for planting. The men talk about how wild and massive the northern territory is. She closes the box and talks about how rich they will get if they do the work properly. One of the merchants concludes that the scholar isn't selling to them a product or a method of harvesting, but a new idea. They wonder if something like that can even be sold. They wonder what she wants, since they can advance without her based on the knowledge they just acquired from her. She asks for them to end the war without victory or defeat, but the merchant gets up and refuses her plans. He speaks to her about how victory has been the reason why they've been sponsoring the war. He makes a sign with his hidden hand behind his back, and the other merchant with him sees it. He adjusts his hat, and the men in the forest see the signal using a scope. The ghosts in the forest who are watching the men send a signal to the head maid. The assassins in the forest prepare to ambush the mansion. The scholar and the merchants continue their arguments. One of the merchants asks the scholar what her motive is, and she says she'd like to benefit from the traders. She says she's just like them, and they all have something to gain in this deal. The merchant, who was talking before, starts laughing. He sees the scholar's point of view and says one is to be a merchant before being a human or a faithful servant of the church. She tells them that she values contracts above all other things, and he agrees with her. He asks that they make a contract. He nods to the other merchant, and he removes his cap. The assassins see the signal and retreat into the forest. The head maid signals to her and she breathes a sigh of relief. They shake hands and seal the deal. Outside the mansion, the trader asks her when they can get ready with the corn, but the scholar tells them that the corn is still being experimented on, and when they are ready, she'll have them delivered to the merchants in no time. The merchant asks her what the strongest bond is, and she says, it's love. The maid nods her head in agreement, and the merchant bursts into laughter. They wonder what is funny, and the merchant tells her it is the second time she has made him feel this way on the same day. He calls her amazing and it makes her pout. She says even a child knows that the strongest bond is love. The merchant looks at her and offers to propose to her. She gets flustered and says he should be ashamed. He apologizes for not bringing a dowry and gifts beforehand. The scholar tries telling him that she cannot accept his proposal, but he says since they will be partners, it'll be a long-term project. He stretches forth his hand and she shakes it, but he pulls her closer and kisses her hand. He asks if he can call her his beloved, but she flusters and denies his request. In the palace of the southern territory, the prince of the land calls out to his teacher and asks if he has seen or tried the potato. The prince himself says he has, and the teacher tells him where the source of information is. He says the convent is the one spreading the potatoes and establishing branches across the nations. The convent also teaches the people of their land new methods of farming and sends produce to the southern territory. The prince concludes that they end the war and support the convent, but the old man advises advises him not to. He believed that their country wouldn't last if they stopped receiving supplies from the merchants. At the mansion in Winter Park Village, the Demon King complains due to the stack of papers that are on her table. The head maid explains the papers contain the lists of purchases the Demon King asks of the merchants. She sighs and wonders when it'll all end. She comments that it's fall and wonders why she hasn't heard a word from the hero. The head maid tells him about the hero and how he always sent letters about his accomplishments to her. She assures the Demon King that the hero is a virgin, and because of that, he has a strong sense of duty, and won't be swayed. The head maid tells her not to frown, if not the wrinkles in her brow will remain permanent. The Demon King sobs, and says that if it happens, she'll take a bite out of the hero. The head maid pets her and gives her tea. The head maid walks into a room to prepare tea and speaks to a trunk, while referring to it as the hero. The hero comes out of the trunk, and admits that she knows where he always is. She asks him for his letter, and he decides to write it immediately. The headmaid stares at him and says, he is avoiding her majesty. 
He admits it, and she says she has always restrained herself from saying anything because she feels it was her place as a servant to ask. She asks that he tell her what is wrong with him and promises not to tell her master. She makes some accurate guesses and it surprises the hero how she knew. She says, her majesty is concerned about him since he hasn't shown up in months. He says the demon king doesn't need him for anything. He says that the demon king feels so compassionate for him and won't let him fight, despite it being part of their contract. The head maid tries telling him that the demon king loves him, but he tells her he knows. He says he is scared of dying and seeing her sad face while he dies. She encourages him and tells him not to feel bad about his feelings for the demon king. She says everything he has and feels belongs to the demon king and he shouldn't forget. The next day, the maids talk about the New Year dance festival coming up soon. They hope the hero returns so he can dance with their master. The older maid recalls a meeting they had recently and realizes the upcoming winter period to be a period of war. The prince of the southern territories is being coerced into sending his men into a naval war where their hopes of winning are very slim. In the mansion, the scholars are excited about going to war, but the female knight comes out and forbids them. She calls them inexperienced and says they do not know the price of war. Inside the mansion, she calls herself a substitute teacher and thinks she isn't good enough. The older maid reassures her of being good and asks if she can be taught how to fight. She calls the female knight a better teacher than the hero. The maid sits with her and they discuss the efforts the female knight has put into pleasing the hero. The female knight notices the maid's behavior and how she is similar to the head maid. The maid says she has lots of ways ahead of her if she wants to be like the head maid. She recalls everyone being nice to her and how she can do a lot of things thanks to the head maid and the crimson scholar. She remembers her childhood and wonders if she's a human. The merchants discuss the plans devised by the holy capital and the church. They plan to retake Aurora Island. They discuss their plans to take over country's naval yards and compasses. They believe that if they can seize Aurora Island, they'll have new trade routes to the west since transporting goods through the island will be far cheaper than by land. He says he's been asked to procure more fish than he currently holds, about five times his current amount. He informs the other merchants about the Crimson Scholar and how smart she is. He calls her his shining star, and it amazes them that the merchant can love something else besides money. They talk about the outcome of the war, whether they win or not. In a town, a soldier blames a demon waiter for spilling his drink. He grabs her and hopes to assault her, but the manager tries stopping him. He hits the manager away and tells them he is the one keeping his town safe. The hero, in the demon armor, walks in and asks the soldier to release her. The soldier doesn't answer, so the hero deals with him. At the port of the southern territory, a soldier commands the fleet and claims they'll reclaim their land from the demons. He makes fun of the previous commander and believes he'll do better. The prince grunts that they'll lose this battle due to him. The hero is housed by the demon waiter. He asks her details about the army, and she answers him. The hero realizes what will happen if any of the sides win the war, and wonders what to do next. The demon girl tells him about the people in the eastern fortress, and how they do not do anything bad. She notes that demons who escape always run towards the east. He thinks of his next step after hearing about the eastern fortress. The demon girl takes him to a temple and asks him why he is on the demon side since he is a human. She asks if he lost when he fought the demon king and he wonders what she meant, but they get interrupted. They hear a demon cursing at humans due to the pain they put him through. The hero explains to the demon girl that he belongs to the demon king, not because he lost. He says winning doesn't make people right. More gives them the right to do as they please. He assures himself and calls himself the path that leads beyond the hill. The ships go into battle and rendezvous with other ships, not far from them. They hear screams and see a ship being swallowed by a demon with tentacles. Many of the demons attack the ship and sink the one which held the Winter King and the White Knight King. The next day, the female knight sits outside the castle and the scholar approaches her. She says the meeting is disastrous. Inside the castle, the prince and the royals gather around the table to mourn the passing of the Winter King. The commander who sent them to reclaim Aurora blames the Winter King for his failure and it makes the prince mad at him. The prince asks him to take responsibility for the 6,000 men he led to their deaths. The man accepts, but calls the prince greedy for amassing wealth from the convent and other sources. The prince gets fed up with him and explains that he'll be cancelling his alliance with them. He will take the burden as the new winter king and find a way to reclaim Aurora. He leaves the meeting room and asks his advisor to dispatch a messenger requesting knights. Later that night at the mansion, the female knight tells the Crimson Scholar that she'll be leaving to heed the call of the new Winter King. The Crimson Scholar bids her farewell but stops. She asks that they become friends and confess to being the Demon King. The female knight doesn't act surprised but pulls out her weapon 
and uses her authority as the prioress of the convent to declare the scholar innocent. She asks the demon king if she regrets taking the hero from her but the demon king from her and she shakes her head. She sheathes her sword and remembers the hero's earlier action. He groveled at her feet and confessed to her about the scholar being the demon king. The female knight shakes the demon king's hand and says she won't give up on the hero. They agree to be friends. Days after, the maids offer the Demon King New Year gifts. One of them is a miniature doll of the hero, and the other is a perfume made from the Lily of the Valley. The two maids give the headmaid a dress that has the embroidery of the Lily of the Valley. They thank the women for taking care of them and wish them a happy new year. The house except for the Demon King leaves to attend the New Year dance festival. The Demon King walks into her room and says it's been a year and she hasn't had a chance to dance with the hero even though she belongs to him. She says she has grown weak even though she's a demon. She lies on her bed and plays with the dolls of the hero that she has. She says she's scared to spill blood despite being a demon. She says she's still doing her best and asks that the doll praise her. The hero appears behind her and says she's done well. She sees him and is so surprised. She slaps him on the cheek, shouts at him, and starts hitting him with a pillow. She asks why he didn't come and see her, and he says he has been busy with Gateway City. He explains that he's been trying to figure out how to get things into the Northern Fortress. She asks him why he wants to do that, but he says she was the one who ordered it. The hero mentions a lot of demon ladies who have been trying their best and says he cannot destroy them because of the hopes they have for her. She gets jealous of him and asks if he isn't just enjoying his time with the ladies. He retorts and talks about her time with the merchants, and she confirms it. The hero becomes sad, and she calls him a weakling. The two of them argue with each other until they hear music coming from outside. The demon king feels embarrassed when the hero offers his hand for a dance. He reassures her and teleports her downstairs where they have enough room to dance. They dance around and the demon king apologizes for not having a gift for him. They try to kiss, but the song stops just before their lips touch. The hero wears his demon armor and says he dropped by to see her. He says he won't be seeing the rest and he won't spend as long as before. He plans on retaking the gateway city within a month. They say they'll meet on the battlefield. He wears his helmet and calls himself her sword, and Path then teleports. The Demon King calls him her light as soon as he leaves. The older maid asks the Demon King about the object in front of them. She tells her it's a fire arrow, an arrow that spreads flame in contact with an object. The maid asks her what war is, why it happens, and why it doesn't end. The Demon King wonders why as well. She explains to the maid that wars are a type of large-scale conflict that arises when two parties clash. She says conflict occurs when different individuals meet. The maid says different individuals can greet and help each other without fighting but the Demon King calls conflict another way people can interact with each other. She explains to the maid that war is one form of conflict but not all conflict is war. She uses an example of the boys in the village trying to give a pretty girl a flower as a conflict. She says conflict is what relationships people can have, but not all relationships people have are conflicts. She tells the maid that it is necessary for development. The little maid enters the study room and informs the Demon King about their carriage, all set to go. She sees a map and asks the Demon King where she's going to meet the hero. The Demon King points at an island on the map as her next destination. She shows them a place far from them and calls it the hero's current location. Soldiers check a castle and see a lot of dead soldiers. They see a Dullahan approach them and call him the Dead Knight. The soldiers run away and cower and the dead knight mocks them. He puts his helmet back on, and the flying skulls around him turn into fairies. The dead soldiers on the ground are just illusions, so he restores them to their current state. The fairies leave after performing their duty, and he calls for a demon bird. He asks the bird to open a dream corridor into the Crusades HQ and give the soldiers terrifying nightmares every night. The female knight meets up with the new Winter King and her former party member. They are at a base, watching Aurora Island through a telescope, and are hoping the demons haven't made their move. The soldiers suffer from nightmares and ask that they leave the battlefield, but the commander pleads with them to stay. The next day, the scholar meets up with the Southern Territory, but gets stopped by the king's advisor. The female knight hopes he didn't suspect the scholar, but he approaches the scholar and asks if he can examine her chest. The female knight takes care of him. They do their introductions, and the Winter King thanks her for her help. She asks him why he wants to retake Aurora Island, and he says it is to establish another trading route, so that his country will no longer be slaves to the organizations of the Central Nations. She comes up with a plan, and they connect Heisenbergs, and add salt to each of them, to make a path to the island. She asks that they do not fight for a whole day. She plans on buying time. 
The next day, after the success of their bridge, the demon servant informs the ice general about the plans the humans came up with. The demons send their armies to fight the humans, to stop them from advancing into Aurora Island. The soldiers fight the demon armies and win against the water creatures. About 500 soldiers lost their lives in the embargo, and it is far smaller compared to the 6,000 men that died in their ships. The female knight tells the army not to rejoice since they only succeeded in making a bridge. She asks that they remain cautious since they are entering the domain of their enemy and their leader. The Ice General is the fiercest of them all. The scholar asks the king how many armed forces they have, and he tells them, 8,000. She says it's not enough to cause a siege against the demons. They ask if she has a plan, and a soldier reports many more armed forces joining them. In the northern country, the soldiers leave despite the plea of the commander. The nightmares from the demon make them leave the country through a gate and teleport to the southern territory to aid the armies in reclaiming Aurora. The northern city, which isn't occupied by soldiers, has been made into a place where demons and humans can coexist. News reaches the Winter King and his men about the demons charging at the gates where their reinforcements hold. They plan on preventing the soldiers' reinforcement from uniting. The hero teleports and evades their meeting. The female knight sees him and leaps on him thereby making the scholar jealous. The hero tells her that he delayed and lost the demon army to get the timing right. They believe the battle will be even. A loud noise distracts them, and they leave their tents. They are informed that the demon general is approaching them. The demon king looks sad, since she doesn't want casualties for her people. The hero tells her not to be sad, and he'll kick the demon general around for a bit, but the female knight suggests going instead. She charges at the demon general, and parries an attack he sends towards a soldier. He sees that she's strong and accepts her challenge. The two of them duel, and he acknowledges her. They fight, and she says it's thanks to the overpowered hero that she became stronger. The female knight fights the demon general, and defeats him, earning the human's victory. The demon king feels sad since she just lost one of her strong men, but the hero comforts her. The king addresses his people, and promises to treat them well. They have a feast to celebrate their reclamation of Aurora Island. He shows the scholar and the female knight to his people and thanks them for their help in defeating the demon general. The king's advisor sees the hero on the balcony and meets up with him. He asks the hero to join the feast, but the hero says he has already made his greetings to the king. The old man shares wine with the hero and says he's too strong. He apologizes for leaving him, but the hero tells him not to. He says the old man taught him a lot of things, and they laugh as they remember the old days. The old man welcomes him back, and they have a toast. The older maid makes a journal of the daily activities happening in the mansion, ever since the hero's return. She says things have been going surprisingly smoothly, despite the head maid not being present. She talks about the female knight, showing impromptu to ruin the quiet time of the hero and the demon king, with an excuse of catching a boar. She writes about how the country has changed, thanks to the new king. She notes that people smile a lot lately in the village. She sees the demon king entering the castle and closes her diary. The hero and the female knight train, they clash their swords and he evades them easily. She gets better and almost hits him. The two of them rinse their bodies after training. They love the way things are, and they both wish it can stay the same. The hero says it won't be long before demons make their move, but the female knight says they should settle who's the wife and who's the mistress. The female knight flusters and plays with her hair as she agrees with the hero. He speaks of the demon king's wish of trying to save both the humans and demons. It makes the female knight conclude that the demon king's motive is the reason why he is smitten with her. She says she's nothing compared to the demon king, but the hero tells her it isn't true. He mentions her practicing how to cut demon meat into smaller sizes to be able to feed the peasants. He looks at her and says, all he can do is fight, and he envies the girls. Inside the mansion, the little maid runs around with orange water and informs the hero about it. She smiles at the hero and informs him that she cooled it with well water. She offers him the drink, and he tries it. The demon king meets up with him and explains to him that the girl used carbonated water. She tells the hero about how smart she is and she can grow up to be a great cook. The little maid runs out of the room happily and the hero notes her for being cheerful lately compared to when she and her sister first got to the mansion. The demon king sits the hero down and combs his hair. She tells him that he'll be meeting with the gateway council and he remembers that he has to attend wearing her armor and acting as the demon king. She asks him to come back as soon as the meeting is over, but he tells her that he has to attend a festival on the main street, a festival meant to coronate the coexistence of humans and demons. The next day, the hero wears the demon armor and meets up with the general of the eastern city. He has a meal with him, but they get interrupted by the daughter of the dragon archduke. 
She calls herself the wife of the Black Knight, but he tries to avoid her. The girl approaches him, and he tries to distance himself. She hugs him, and it causes an earthquake at Winterpass Village. The headmaid runs into the Demon King's room as soon as the rumbling stops and comments on the earthquake being the second time in that same month. They talk about pushing plans into motion. The Demon King asks the headmaid to send her bed to the Underworld Palace. She sees the countenance of the head maid and assures her that they'll meet soon. The hero teleports the maid and the scholar to the Iron Country. The hero asks the scholar why the older maid is with them, and she says that she's been teaching the older maid her work. She believes the older maid to be smarter than the noble scholars. They walk through the town, while the scholar talks about the significance of education. They reach an ore and are shown metal blocks. The blocks have carvings on them. The scholar calls it the printing press. Later that night in the mansion, the hero holds a letter in his room and is amazed about how the printing press can make thousands of letters. He holds the letter and then falls asleep. Outside the door, the female knight carries tea and sees the demon king trying to open the door to the hero's room. They ask each other what they are doing. The female knight shows her a letter written to the hero by the dragon princess. She says she saw the letter in the convent. She talks about how urgently she needs to talk to the hero, but the demon king refuses. She almost slips up but shuts up. The headmaid sees them and offers to go on their behalf, but they refuse. She summons a ghost maid and pushes the two of them into the room. They argue on who should stay on his bed, but they see the hero dozing off. They stay on either side of the bed and run their hands through his hair. The Demon King informs the female knight about having to leave the mansion the next day for the demon world. She hopes things go well and leaves the hero in the care of the female knights. The hero hears everything but pretends to be asleep. The next day, the Demon King plans on leaving for the underworld, but the hero tries to stop her. She tells him to fulfill his job and calls him another version of her. The Demon King hands the older sister maid a ring. She says, it's from the fairies, and it can be used to change appearances. She'll want the older maid to go in her steed for meetings, where she is needed. She agrees, and the hero teleports the Demon Lord and the head maid to the underworld gates. He sees her off and leaves. In another mansion, the former commander of the Southern Territorial Army speaks with the ex-commander of the Northern Army. They swear to enact their vengeance on the Eastern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom for the humiliation brought upon them. The merchant who proposed to the Crimson Scholar earlier enters their mansion. The little maid shakes nervously as she serves him tea. The female scholar enters the room and welcomes the merchant into her mansion. They sit and have tea. The Crimson Scholar asks him what brings him to her mansion, and he says he came to deliver the balance sheet of their expenses. The merchant speaks in a roundabout way about deceit and fakes, and it makes the Crimson Scholar nervous. The hero walks in and removes the fairy ring from her finger, and she turns into a housemaid. The hero tells her not to feel bad and the merchant could tell from the beginning that she wasn't the scholar. She excuses herself as she leaves the room. The hero and the merchant greet each other. He notes the merchant has changed somewhat. They discuss what makes men change. The merchant says the hero looks like someone who can conquer the world. The hero reminds the merchant of the promise he made to him about being celebrated upon his return. He teleports the merchant severally till they arrive on a hill. The sky is covered with aurora. He tells the merchant that they are in a demon realm he reveals the scholar to be a demon and shows him Gateway City. He teleports the merchant with him and they appear in the city where demons and humans feast. The hero explains to him that Gateway City is the only place where humans and demons can coexist. He teleports the merchant with him to the land of the demons and the merchant realizes that he is on the demon's side. He corrects the merchant and says he is on the scholar's side. The dragon princess meets up with them and tells the hero of the banquet he asked her to prepare early. They have a feast at the banquet, and the hero speaks with him. After the party, the hero and the merchant lie on a mat while staring at the aurora. He asks the merchant for his opinion concerning Gateway City. The merchant sees it as an okay city. The hero tells him that he'll sell the rights to the merchant, and the merchant asks for what he will like in return. The hero sits up from where they are lying down and talks about how the scholar is like a merchant but she doesn't ask for things in return. He says he'll hand over the rights to the merchant, and his condition is he'll behave as righteous as the scholar. In the underworld, the head maid welcomed the demon king back to her castle. She asks her if she saw the great elder, and she affirms. They walk through the castle and discuss how the concentration of magical energy in the air has grown. The demon king asks the maid to slay her in case she becomes unstable after entering an ancient room. The maid promises to do so and watches the demon king open the door and enter. Outside the mansion in the village, the female knight kneels in front of the hero and stretches her sword to him. She asks that he appoint her officially as his knight. She says the demon king is someone amazing, and she won't like to take him from him. 
but she'd like to be his knight. He ponders for a bit before taking the sword from her. The hero appoints her as his knight, and she gets relieved. In the village, hunters give the maids their game, and thank the scholars for making sure they have enough for winter. The men say they owe the head maid for providing soaps for the villagers and serfs. The older sister maid remembers the head maid saying she hated insects and wonders why her actions are contradicting her statement. A man on a horse of the soldiers of light arrives outside the winter army territory, and informs the king about the scholar's teachings of being a heretic. He is asked to mobilize soldiers. The merchant sees the letter and wonders if it's due to the elections. The news reaches the nuns and asks that they call the prioress back to the convent. Later that night, the people in the mansion prepare to have their dinner, but they get interrupted by visitors. The Winter King and the old man tell the hero about the letter. They realize it's a scheme done by a group of people to get rid of the scholar. They think of letting someone take the fall while disguising as the scholar, but the members of the mansion strongly refuse it. The hero says he'll handle it, due to the scholar not being present. He meets the elder maid and asks that she let them arrest her. He plans on rescuing her. As soon as she's out of the winter country, he'll be going against the church. The female knight wants to go with him but he refuses and says he'll handle it on his own. They feel bad for letting him go against the church, but he ensures them that he'll be alright. The merchants discuss with each other about their next strategy. They decide that a new council of ten must be formed. Another merchant enters the room and introduces a diplomat of the ice country. The merchant asks the diplomat of the bard country to put a stop to whatever the council of ten is doing to gather information. He plans to buy time before the council ruins the fortunes the scholar has brought to them. He assures them that he'll do his best. Outside the church, people gather to protest against the church's claim that the Crimson Scholar is a heretic. The hero and the female knight stare at the crowd from a tower. He is surprised as to how the peasants regard the Crimson Scholar as a goddess. The older sister maid watches her sister sleep, and she recalls all the good teachings the Crimson Scholar put the whole village through. They feel bad that the Crimson Scholar has done so much for them, and they cannot return the favor. They hear the sound of the town's bell ringing, and they decide it's time for them to move. The hero sees the older maid being nervous and assures her that he'll be there for her. She holds the ring as soon as the hero leaves. She starts crying and blaming herself for being helpless. The hero teleports outside the town and watches over it. One of the leaders of the church gets in front of the church. The people of the town watch the king of the southern territory as he rides his horse into view. The church messenger asks for the scholar, and the king presents her to the audience. They check to confirm if she is a double and nod their head in affirmation. The scholar is chained and whipped by the church messenger's men. The king tries to stop them but the old man stops him. After they were done with whipping her, she was given a chance to address the audience. She speaks to the audience and shares her backstory of being a serf. She talks about the hardship she faced as one and how life showed her kindness later on. She calls herself a human and says the first step into becoming a human is by declaring that they are one. The scholar talks to everyone and says that they all have blood beating in them, and they deserve freedom. The church messenger hits her on the head with a stick and calls her a heretic. The hero teleports to the top of a nearby roof and watches the scene. He stops himself from intervening. She continues her speech and calls out to the people of Winter's Passage Village. She beckons on them not to stop wishing and working. She says that the king and the holy church cannot take the people's freedom to be better from them. She refuses to listen to the head priest despite the number of times he hits her. The scholar says she'll no longer be treated like an insect. The priest gives up and asks the crowd to cast stones on her. The people tremble but the scholar asks them to throw the stones if they wish to protect themselves and their families. She says they are insects if they stone her for any other reason besides their protection, then they are insects. She says she despises insects because she is a human. The scholar kneels on the stage waiting to be stoned, but the people cast stones on the church leader. The leader asks the king to arrest the people, but he watches them. The leader sees that the king is not answering him, so he orders his guard to get rid of the scholar. The people try to protect the scholar by stoning the guards that get close to her. The scholar apologizes in her head to the hero for not leaving matters to him. She apologizes for not having the chance to call the head maid her teacher. A guard gets close to her and tries beheading her, but the king parries his sword. The female knight cuts the scholar's chains while the king approaches the church messenger. He speaks to the church messenger angrily and calls himself an insect for listening to the bidding of other nations. He thanks them, scholar for making him realize who he is and his position. The female knight walks up to the leader and says she's ashamed of him. She quotes the scriptures of the light and explains how he's misusing them. The king declares protection upon the crimson scholar and the prioress calls her a saint before the people. The people yell at the priest and ask him to go away. 
He looks at the king and says, he'll make him regret siding with the blasphemers. He calls the king and his nation, blasphemers, and leaves the town. The hero sighs, since he sees that he doesn't have to interrupt. A demon on a throne reacts as soon as his eyes show him the scholar. He wonders why his seal's eye reveals her to him since he believes he'll be the one who will eventually rule the world. He wonders what his eye is trying to tell him. On returning to the capital, the hero hugs the elder sister maid and says that he asked her to wait for his signal. She apologizes, but he calls her a for her speech. He says she moved the soldiers with her words. The hero and the girls gather in the nation of the Winter King. They all apologize for causing enmity between the central nation and the southern territory. The lords of the land meet, and they discuss the serfs wanting to gain independence. They wonder how royalty will accept the matter. One of the lords concludes that they free the serfs. The king wonders if it's a good mood, since they are not sure they can stand against the central nations. A guard informs them about how it'll take at least six months for the central nation to gather their soldiers to go against them. The hero asks the objective of the central nations and who they are. The female knight tells him about how the central nation's objective is to gather wealth, knowledge, respect, and power. The sister maid concludes that it's the reason why the world will never have universal prosperity. She explains to them that the scholar told them that true prosperity starts with the free flow of wealth and goods. The little sister's maid enters the meeting room and offers them strawberry and pear pie. The hero looks at her and smiles. He sees the pie and has an idea. The merchants discuss the latest happenings. They say the church in the southern territory has changed from being the Church of the Light Spirit to becoming the true Church of the Light Spirit. The chairman of the merchants laughs for not being able to anticipate the move. He suspects the hero for being involved in this case. He reads a letter that informs him of the liberation of the serfs. The chairman notices the letter and sees that it's different from normal parchment letters. He recalls his meeting with the scholar and asks his fellow merchant how many of the types of letters have been made. The merchant tells him over 3,000 copies. He asks for the council's vote count concerning the nations. Three are in support of the central nations, while two are in support of the southern nation. The chairman comes up with an idea. He plans on buying as much capital as possible so that they can sell currency. The hero and the king's council meet another day. They discuss the low immigration rate that they are having. A female council member suggests that they use songs to teach the people about what the church is doing, but the older maid suggests that they should not involve the people. She suggests that they sing about how their land has hope, the taxes are low, no serfdom, and if they work hard, they'll reap the fruits of their labor. The king buys the idea and commends the elder sisters made for being level-headed. The head merchants meet with each other. One of them sees the chairman writing multiple parchments. He calls it a product purchase agreement. He plans on buying in advance from the central nations, forcing them to produce no matter what since he will pay in advance. His major goal is to hoard and create artificial scarcity. He plans on keeping the nobility in the central nations, thinking about next year's wheat market. He plans on using the fear of the prices of goods rising to make them rich. He plans to loan the central nations money and looks for an alliance around the southern triad. He picks the southern convent as a good spot. The Eastern General speaks with the Horned Dragon about how they have run out of potatoes and salt. The Dragon Princess interrupts their discussion and speaks to the Eastern General alone. She asks him if he is familiar with the Azure Demons. She explains that the Azure Demons are a greater race of demons and, from them, demon kings have been born the most. She speaks of their wishes to conquer the human world more than any other group of demons. She informs him about a rumor that the Azure Demons are secretly in contact with humans in the Gateway City. In a town in the Central Nation, a civilian bargains the price of wheat with a shop owner, and he is surprised at the cost of wheat. A man on a horse walks by and asks for cheaper wheat. He examines the wheat and says, he'll take 25 bags. The man tells the civilian that the wheat is cheap. The civilian agrees to buy at the price the man with his horse did, but the shop owner tells him that the price has increased due to the quantity bought by the horse owner. The chairman discusses with his other merchant partner the rise in wheat prices. He plans on stopping the three members of the ten councils that are in support of the central nations from making a move. He says he'll hire a group of assassins to keep them quiet for two weeks. The news reaches the southern territory, and the prices of goods in the holy capital have skyrocketed, and people cannot afford to buy them because there aren't enough goods. The noble scholar present at the King Council's meeting suspects the situation to be controlled by unknown forces. He suspects that people will rush to their territory to get their goods and commodities, and it'll ruin their economy. The king asks him if he has a way to counter it, and he suggests that they use a tariff. The economist asks that they task people who plan on exporting goods out of their territory. He suggests a high fee 
and he says it's for their nation's sake. A general in his room gives a command to his guard to buy a thousand mercenaries. He plans on using the people to amass power and become a count. The chairman of the merchants writes a letter and wonders how the southern triad will respond. He looks outside the window and sees the dragon princess. He rushes outside and brings her in. The merchant asks what she's doing here, and she says she came on her own accord to meet him. She says a passing mage used detection magic to direct her to where he was. The chairman realizes that there are a lot of things he doesn't know about. The princess asks him for salt and she doesn't give him an exact value. She calls salt a valuable commodity and trusts him as someone capable of fulfilling her wish. He remembers the hero's request and decides he'll help her. He says there are a lot of things they do not know. The Demon King recalls her time in the castle with the head maid, how she was chosen to be the Demon King, and the maid looked worried about her. The maid warned her about how the Demon Kings of old would possess her mind and body, but she assured the maid that she would still be herself. The maid wondered how she'd rule the Demon Realm if she didn't have the prowess of the previous Demon Kings. She promised the maid not to use violence, and showed her a prophecy about a child that would be born soon and how she'd love to meet the child 15 years later. The maid told her that she had lost her mind, but the Demon King revealed the fate to be something different from what had been written in the library. Currently, the king informs the hero about a letter containing the central nation declaring war against them. He concludes that it is because of the heavy taxes placed upon people who want to export their produce. The hero asks the king when the war will happen, and the king tells him it's during winter, which is in 10 days. The hero gets mad and wonders if there's a way for him to prevent the war from happening. He remembers his time with the demon king and asks the king how long they can fight a war without casualties. The king tells him that it depends on the snow. The king swears on his name to prevent casualties. The dragon princess and the merchant chairman meet with other merchant leaders. A fellow chairman enters the room and informs them of the plan the government is doing to ensure the holy capital's effort to ensure the new currency stands. He tells them the value of the exchange rate and the law that forbids its citizens from using the old currency. The head merchant explains the plot of the government in fixing their inflation and recession to the dragon princess who disguises herself like a human. He wonders if the government can maintain their rate. Outside the southern triad's border, the central nation camped and gathered forces. The southern triad people offer their enemies alcohol and cool drinks, and it makes the enemy wonder if they aren't willing to fight them. The former commander of the White Knight Country and the Northern Country hear the news about the scholar being alive. They get angry and plan on how to launch a surprise attack at the City of Iron, where her heresy books are being produced. The hero and the king's council discuss their next step to take regarding the upcoming war. The king informs the hero about his strategy to stall the battle till the snow falls. The female knight mentions how massive the troops of the central nations will be compared to hers. She plans on sending 4,500 troops against their enemies, 200,000 troops. They get interrupted by a messenger who informs them of 1,500 demon forces heading their way. The hero says he'll take care of the demons himself. He asks the king if he believes that he doesn't want to fight the enemies. The king looks at him sternly and agrees that they should do whatever it takes to avoid fighting a war on two fronts. The merchant chairman meets up with the financial minister of the Southern Triad. The minister guesses the chairman to be the one who created the artificial scarcity. They decide to negotiate. The merchant asks for four things from the minister, and the minister analyzes the requests of the merchant. He sees the merchant as the top dog of the economy and wonders if he should accept their deal. The hero teleports to face the demons on his way. He recalls the conversations he had with the Demon King. He stops and sees Azure Demons who are equipped for long-distance travel. He plans to make them withdraw. The Mage interrupts him and says he should include her in his plans. The Demon King steps out of the door and asks the Maid to take her to the battlefield. The Maid sees that she's been possessed and tries to slay her, but she's too weak to do so. The Demon King cuts off the Maid's hand when they combat and it makes the maid scream. The hero asks the mage where she's been all the while, but she places her head on his hand and uses communication magic on him. She informs him of the Demon King's awakening and asks that he go and meet her while she faces the Azure Demons. She tells him to use his strongest spell to destroy the gate. He asks if it's all right for him to do so, and the mage affirms. The financial minister guesses what the merchant is after and concludes that he plans on creating a dual currency system. The merchant praises him for his intelligence and says the current economic condition of the central nations is the perfect time for them to adopt the dual currency system. The minister asks if he plans on going beyond their territory and opening trade relations with the demons. He answers positively and says it's because he is a merchant 
He says everybody will agree to be happy, and it's their job to compromise and trade. The dragon princess removes her headgear and reveals her horns. She introduces herself as the representative of the gateway city. The hero flies away and hears the mage analyzing the battlefield. He looks back and sees her teleporting the demons. He gets to the gate and uses a thunderbolt spell to destroy the gate. The mage orders him to fly deep into the pillar of smoke he caused, and he does so. The soldiers of the Iron Nation watch from their camp as the soldiers of the White Knight lay in ambush for a surprise attack. Another soldier tells him not to rush into battle, but to isolate the soldiers. They lay their plans and start the war. The soldiers of the White Knight spread thin, and the armies of the Iron Nation counterattack. The hero dives into the pillar of smoke and feels wine pushing against him. He arrives at the demon realm and wonders how, until the mage explains to him how the demon realm is directly beneath them. She informs him that the demon king is waiting for him and nearly becomes the king of evil. She orders him to go to the heart of the demon king's castle at the lowest level. The injured head maid tries to buy time from the demon king by reminding her of the hero. She notes that she'll die soon if the demon king comes out of the door. The hero accelerates into the castle and feels the overwhelming magic of the demon king. He wonders why she's so powerful. The southern triads send their enemies food and wine for them to hold a banquet. They plan on sending their enemy horses meals the following day. They plan to feed the horses bad oats to sicken them. The Iron Country messengers meet their commanders and give reports of their victory against the White Knight Army. They inform the commander about the leader of the army they are pursuing, and he asks that they leave him be for the time being, and then be on patrol later. The hero breaks into the room where the Demon King is. He sees her but the headmaid warns him about her being corrupted by the ancient demon kings. The demon king brings out a scythe and attacks the hero, but he stops it from hitting him. The mage meets up with the hero's party, and she informs them about the whereabouts of the hero. She gives them the order she received from the scholar and asks that they exterminate smallpox. They do not believe it to be possible, but she opens her hat and gives them a parcel containing how to get rid of the virus. She explains that people who recover from smallpox can't get it again. She suggests that they treat all the citizens for a gold coin, and it can help them in their war. She also informs the people that the scholar is a demon. The mage falls asleep after delivering their information. The Minister of Finance present with them confirms that demons are intelligent and are capable of language. He believes the demons to be divided into different nations just like humans are. He remembers his discussion with the Dragon Princess and asks that they fulfill the scholar's request. The sister maids work in the printing press of the Iron Country, but they get invaded by the commander of the White Knight. The hero holds the scythe of the demon lord and talks to her. He asks that she not give her life away. He informs her about how her maid has made her a genuine saint. She grabs him by the throat and raises him into the air. She asks that he join her in her conquest but he refuses. She tells him that if he does, she'll give him half of the world. The demon king wonders why he refuses her, and he tells her that the world doesn't belong to her. He teleports her and hugs her. He reminds her that her body belongs to him. She fights with the ancient demons possessing her and wins. She comes back to her senses and the hero welcomes her. In the Iron Nation, the commander of the Iron Forces sees a stabbed soldier on the floor. He hears the cry of a girl inside the building and gets down from his horse. In the building, the commander of the White Knight Army takes the little maid hostage and asks the elder maid to kneel before him while apologizing to the Light Spirit. She says she believes in the Light Spirit and he kicks and steps on her. The White Knight commander calls her a heretic and plans to send her to hell with his sword but he gets interrupted by the commander of the Iron Forces. The girls hug each other, while the two soldiers prepare to engage in battle. In the Demon Realm, the hero heals up the headmaid's arm as the Demon King holds it together. The hero tells the Demon King about everything happening on the surface. In the Southern Territory border, the Central Nation's army discusses over fire and why they are running out of food. They hear a rumor of the church and the Central leaders talking about who to take over the Southern Territory once it's fallen. The soldiers get mad as soon as they realize that they've been played. The female knight confirms from their messengers that their opponent hasn't begun to attack them. The soldier informs them that a few mercenaries have decided to attack on their own. The female knight says she'll be going out to prepare for battle and hopes it doesn't become a prolonged one. She orders hundreds of her men to intercept the mercenaries. The Iron Commander and the White Knight Commander face off. The Iron Commander gets injured in the battle 
but manages to fall with the white knight commander downstairs. The female knight takes her people and fights the mercenaries. She splits her people into groups and confuses the enemies. The enemies split and follow them, so they head to their rendezvous point. The girls head downstairs to see the soldier, but they see the corpse of the white knight commander on the floor. They look for the soldier, and he calls to them while hanging from a chain. The female knight discusses with her soldiers regrouping and knocking their opponents off their horses. She calls them their fellow men and hopes they do not kill them. Snow begins to fall, and she calls the snow their greatest reinforcement. In the Central Nations, the leaders argue with each other. They discuss with the Azure Demons about their plans for them to act as the Church's enemy. The priest of the Church promises to raise a third crusade of the Holy Key. The nobles wonder how they'll capture the Demon King since the Demon Land is too big. A noble holds out a gun and says the Crimson Scholar hired someone in the Iron Country to develop it. He believes that if the weapons can be mass-produced, they can be used to conquer. A great bishop speaks to the members of the church and asks them to obtain the key, the Demon King's life, and the desires of the church. They bow and vow to do, as he says. The mage stays in a cave and speaks to her bird. She shows it ancient magic spells that lie in the pool. She drops liquidized magic into the pool and she transforms into another being, revealing her true form. The next day, the Demon King meets with her people and addresses them. The Black Knight wears her armor and meets up with her. The Black Knight brings out a sword and makes a flashy move, but the people get confused. The Head Maid whispers to him to do an even flashier move so he uses magic to obliterate a nearby mountain. The crowd cheers and believes in his might. She speaks to her people but they thirst for blood and war against the humans. She tries convincing them, but her voice is unheard. She asks if he's okay and reassures her that he'll be with her for as long as it takes. In the mansion in the village, the Demon King reads the news and hears about the dual currency system. The elder sister's maid informs her about the good behavior of the merchant towards the demons and how he proposes to make trades with the demons. The Demon King and the female knight have tea in a room. The knight informs him about how she gave herself to the hero and it makes the Demon King fluster. She corrects herself and says, it's her sword she gave to the hero. She asks the knight while she's telling her, and the knight says, it's because they are friends. The Demon King tells her that a part of her still feels like the hero deserves a human, even though it saddens her. They shake their hands as they acknowledge their love for the hero. Later that night, the hero and his party have a feast in the mansion. After the party, late at night, the Demon King discusses with her maid how the elder sister's maid surprises her. The head maid feels she doesn't have much to teach the elder sister maid, and it makes the demon king smile. The head maid notices that she's crying, and says she finally has her wish. The demon king turns to her, and says she loves this world, 